It's a great pleasure to welcome into our spotlight for the evening, Dr. Jacqueline Fox. So our theme for this year's Business Week and Executive Dinner is globalization and the global economy. How have you seen globalization evolve in your career? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about a part of that that's not uh, covering my career. So does anybody, let's have a little bit of fun with this question. Does anybody know uh, the first multinational company, who, what company that was? The first one. There's no history students in the room. It was founded in 1602. Dutch, Dutch East India was the first multinational company. Was the first company to issue stock. As a matter of fact, it went bankrupt in 1800. After 200 years of very successful operations and almost 200 years and almost 200 years of paying dividends, <laughs> does anybody know why it went bankrupt? Tulips. I'm coming to that. But <laughs> it wasn't tulips, actually. It didn't go bankrupt because they didn't know how to do business as a multinational. They actually were quite successful, very savvy uh, traders. They had more, you know, a lot of expats, actually. They would take people, put them on boats, and you know, send them out to far-flung uh, places. I don't think they had tax equalization packages or anything like that. But they went bankrupt in 1800 after 200 years of successful global operations because of corruption. Corruption. The tulip <laughs> crisis happened when? 1637, and what happened with the tulip thing? The Dutch became actually international traders of tulips, and because of very strong tulip demand from <laughs> other countries, notably the French, the French are always meddling in something, you know, they're always doing something. Um, but the uh, prices of tulips went through the roof in 1637. And at one point, were trading for 10 times the annual salary of a skilled craftsman for one tulip bulb. They created tulip futures. <laughs> And so there, all of this trading was going on around tulips with no actual tulip bulbs even changing hands. And there was this huge bubble that was created. All these uh, speculative investors jumped into the tulip uh, frenzy, a little bit like biotech uh, today. And <laughs> they, prices got away from them. I think people actually didn't understand the whole derivatives trading uh, concept. And then that bubble burst, and a lot of people lost a lot of money. So why am I talking about this um, based on the question that you asked me? I think the economy has actually been global for a very, very long time. We uh, even see that financial markets were probably created and derivative instruments were traded even before we think about them in the way that we think about uh, them today. So some of what I think uh, we're seeing now may be a reflection of just the current times uh, that we have. I think a lot of the lessons of uh, global uh, economic interactions and the interdependencies of countries really haven't fundamentally changed uh, that much from an economic uh, standpoint. The French caused uh, the Dutch uh, tulip crisis, uh, so to speak. So those interconnections were already there. A, a few things that, at least in my limited uh, career and exposure, have, have seen uh, with respect to how this has evolved, I think one of them is kind of obvious. I think it has a lot to do with technology and just the rapidity with which uh, information is available and the, the, the depth and breadth of the, the information that is available. So I think that uh, has created a situation where you have not only issues around uh, how competitive uh, you have to be uh, to deal with that, but 
just also the, the need to be able to react even faster to um, there's pricing you know related issues and all uh, all sorts of things so I think the that is is one thing you know if we think about the financial markets everybody reads about that quite regularly I think it's pretty obvious that the technology is causing good things in financial markets but also the uh, a little bit more volatility at least that's what I would observe over um, you know the, the time that I've been doing what I do one of the things that I think is a bit of a nuance that is related to all of this I think it's extremely important uh, though is that when we talk about globalization I'm not sure that it always means exactly what we think it does. I think a simple interpretation of the concept led to a lot of companies saying, oh my gosh, I've got to get out of my domestic market and I've got to go where the growth uh, is or I see somebody else doing it, I better go do that. And I think American companies have been particularly maybe guilty of this of saying, I'm just gonna take my model and I'm just gonna go do that in China or I'm going to go do that in India or I'm going to go do that in Europe. And I think that a desire to chase growth but in a very naive uh, way actually led to, over the last 30 or 40 years to a lot of situations where companies actually really weren't as successful as they thought they would be uh, in certain places. So a, a naive concept about uh, I'm going to go out and have a global business model, I think, has shown that it really doesn't work very well because you still have to be able to do business according to the local um, way of, of doing things. Um, so how, and how that's starting company, to change a little bit. Right, right, how would a company do that better if they were going to go to a new country and not just say, I'm going to import my business model, what should they do instead? Well, I think, the, the, frankly, the Europeans have historically been more successful at this than many others, and maybe one of the reasons for that is given the size of uh, each individual country in Europe. I mean, to the French-Dutch example, which was uh, designed to be a little bit humorous, but to mm -hmm. also you know, illustrate uh, something. I think those uh, interdependencies across uh, countries in Europe have been there for a very long time. And so I think uh, the European countries, um, just given smaller distances and all sorts of things, uh, learned a long time ago how to at least navigate different environments within uh, Europe. And so when they went uh, out, uh, and historically, if you look at the consumer packaged goods uh, companies or uh, there's a number of other uh, industries, even pharmaceuticals, frankly, uh, the Europeans went into uh, other markets with a view that they needed to think about what would work in that market and keep maybe the framework of their business model but allow it to be adapted uh, to the local market and they've been far more successful. As an example, Nestle, if you get a Kit Kat bar in uh, China or a Kit Kat bar in the UK or a Kit Kat bar in the US, the recipe is different. A little bit different cocoa content, a little bit different sugar content, and it's tailored to uh, go with the tastes of the of the local uh, population. So that's a very smart thing to do. Yeah. And you'd have some efficiency expert come along and tell you you could be more efficient with your cost structure if you would only have one recipe and go <laughs> do that one recipe everywhere. But if you do that and your costs are low and you don't sell as many Kit Kat bars, business model is probably not going to work, right? So. So what advice do you have for the students in the room who are preparing to compete in the global economy? I probably don't have any better advice than your moms and dads do. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? They're all going, yeah. Um, to be, I would say, to be very uh, perceptive about the cultural environment that you're in, to think about what someone's, someone else's perspective uh, could be on a given topic or style. One of the first lessons that I learned when I moved to Switzerland uh, in 1993 was to be less direct. It, the, I, in the end, I got to the same place by being a little bit less direct, but at, when I first moved over there, I'm a very direct person, in case you can't tell, the, and something would come up, we'd be in a meeting talking about a particular topic, and I would say, well, but we should just, you know, go do that. Look at me. 
<laughs> well, we don't know if we're going to do that. And we walk out of the room. One day I had my boss take me aside and he said, look, you're right. And that's what we're going to end up doing, I'm sure. But let's get there a little bit different way. And if we get there a little bit different way and you let people kind of come to it on their own, then they'll embrace it faster and then and it'll be more uh, successful. So I had to learn to adapt my style. And I think that's um, one of the biggest things is being perceptive about um, the differences in that regard and then, and then adapting uh, to that, which takes also, and you're going to laugh when I'm when looking at this table of Goolsby people, but it takes some self-awareness about how you see things too, to then think about how somebody else might see it differently and figure out what will be successful in that you know, environment that you're going into. Whereas you were going through the list of my past experience, I actually thought it sounded like I couldn't hold a job. <laughs> You've been working for a while. So. I've been working for a while. Now that's going to get you in trouble because what does that mean? Does that mean I started young or no? Then it's, uh, no, the last time I changed jobs, my mom said, yeah, she just can't hold a job. And, I, and so, because it sounded like a lot, but I actually think having all those different experiences in the different environments really has given me. Um, a, a greater skill set to draw on with respect to thinking about what those different perceptions could be and how somebody else might uh, see something versus how I would see it and then adapt um, accordingly. So. so have you found there to be cultural difference between the Northeast and Texas as well? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is that bigger or smaller than the difference between, say, Switzerland and Texas? Oh, yeah, I actually think there may be more difference between New York and Texas than there is between Switzerland and Texas. So, <laughs> and New Jersey is a whole other thing. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> so, so we think about culture and country often together, but they're not necessarily It's the not same necessarily thing. the same thing, yeah. And you can have a bigger yeah. cultural divide even within the... You can have a cultural country. divide within, uh, between industries, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you can have, uh, we see that to some extent, you know, it's a really good point in uh, biotechnology, we see a big difference versus large pharmaceutical companies. And you think, well, they're all in healthcare, everybody should be about the same. And uh, a biotech company is much more uh, informal, uh, much, much more uh, creative, uh, agile, nimble, let the scientists you know, play around with some things and take some risks and some chances and see what happens. And uh, large pharma's gotten a little bit away from that. And so they haven't stayed as innovative and creative maybe. So, you see those differences all over the place, yeah, I would say. So I think diversity of experience is really a very important thing. So if you change jobs a few times, it's okay. Don't let anybody tell you that you shouldn't do that. It's fine. <laughs> so given the trend that we're seeing of globalization, and maybe it's been around for a while, what do you feel that U.S. businesses need to do in order to, whether it's reach new markets or do business in new markets, or do we need to be more global? Should we just shut the borders? And you know, I think it's a great question. I, when I think about the, the example of uh, pharmaceuticals, the, for quite a few years in the recent past, you had a lot of companies running around saying, oh, there's going to be a huge growth opportunity in China. Oh, there's going to be a huge growth opportunity in India. There's going to be a huge growth opportunity here and there. And a lot of the uh, story around wh where they were going to see growth in the future was from emerging markets. And that sounded really good. If you go look at the actual uh, experiences and data, did anybody read the stories about GlaxoSmithKline in China? Okay, so they go into China, all these growth opportunities, they end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and all over the place and in a lot of trouble and some of their executives thrown into jail because of for, Foreign Corrupt Practice Act violations and corruption and all sorts of things not because they went in there and intended to do that. And I'm pretty sure that the executives in most of the senior positions in that local um, affiliate of GSK weren't involved in that. But what they hadn't understood when they went in there is that it's common practice in China to essentially pay doctors to prescribe your drug. And it's happened over many, many, many years because physicians don't make very much money. And frankly, the administrators in the regulatory agencies and you know the bureaucrats doing the price setting and all those things make more money than the doctors. And this just evolved over time. 
in a way that you know we would say, well, that's not ethical and all of those sorts of things, but you can kind of understand how it happened if you go spend a little bit of time to, to think about that environment. You have to know that if you're going to go in there and do business and then you come to the conclusion, I'm not going to do business that way, so then should I even go? Mm -hmm. And there's been a number of uh, companies in the last six to 12 months actually say, we're not going to do business in China anymore mm -hmm. because they feel like the risk of not being able to weed that out down at the lowest level of the organization is something that they're not willing to take on and they feel like they can't be competitive in that local market if that's not the way they're going to do business. There's a, a company in the biotech space that's had a, what is a very good product. I mean, I can actually even say what it is because all this is public uh, information. The product is uh, Rituxan and it's a great product. It's, I think it's about a seven or eight billion dollar product now in cancer, uh, bloodborne cancers. They went into China about 10 years ago thought it was going to be a billion dollar drug in China and if you look at the incidence rates of the diseases it treats, it should be, mm -hmm. even with pricing differences, it's doing about 130 million dollars. They didn't understand the market. They didn't understand what it was going to take to, for that to be a billion dollar drug in China or whether it even could be a billion dollar drug in China based on the practice of medicine in China and diagnosis rates and all sorts of things. So, I mean, I just think those are examples where you, we have to figure out what our core competencies are and how we can leverage them in other markets and not just go chase, you know, kind of the latest uh, thing or, or a growth fad or, or whatever. But I think even now, more than ever, maybe the other thing that we need to be thinking about is who's gonna come here? Mm and compete with us on our turf and do it better than we do it here. And I think sometimes that's a, that aspect of the sort of competitive threat is not something that we maybe spend quite as much time on. Did anybody predict, probably somebody in this room did, probably a smart student did, predict that Alibaba was gonna come and IPO and compete with, right? I mean. Probably five years ago, nobody really thought about it. Well, if that was on somebody's radar screen, I, you know, you might have done something a little bit different or you would have at least been ready for it. So I think we, we really need to give a lot of thought to that. Yeah, but I think that's a good point. We often think about going and we may want to think about, well, who's going to come here? And then how are they thinking about things? And how do they perceive, you know, life? Um, often Japanese companies will make, will give themselves a much longer investment horizon when they go after something because their shareholders are a little bit less demanding in the short term than U.S. shareholders are. So because they have more patient shareholders, they can go out and make investments for a longer period of time. And, you know, what did they do? At least, okay, we can talk about the Japan case, but the automakers certainly did a number mm -hmm. on everybody for a while at least, right? So. So you spent much of your career in biotech or some related fields. Mm -hmm. How has that industry changed over time? Well, I think it's been a, a bit of a tale of, of multiple worlds, I, I think. Um, in, in some respects, at some point, large pharma kind of went one direction and biotech uh, went another direction. I think large pharma pursued probably, maybe because they had to, um, did a little bit of this chasing of growth, either geographically or um, looking at which therapeutic categories were going to grow and then jumping into those rather than staying focused on their core competencies, the science. So I think there was a temptation at some point to forget about the science and maybe to some extent ignore the patient a little bit and say, well, rather than focusing on what my scientific expertise is, I'm gonna go chase cardiovascular, I'm gonna go chase you know, this because that's where the growth is. So what you saw at one point is that part of the industry went down a path of more therapeutic categories and maybe less depth of science in any of them. 
And we've sort of seen that kind of fall apart as growth uh, stalled, and then there was a lack of innovation. So there's been a lot of criticism for lack of innovation uh, in that part of the, the industry. And now you see the large pharma companies pulling back and really trying to refocus, hopefully, on science and what they're um, good at. Whereas biotech, I think and if you look at the large uh, biotech uh, companies, you saw those companies stay more focused, stay uh, on the science, maybe take a little bit longer to uh, put the investments in and wait for the science to play out. Uh, Celgene's a very good example of um, didn't have positive cash flows for 20 years, I think. The first 20 years of its now 27-year existence, the cash flows were not positive. Now their investors were very patient for all those years too, but they followed the science and then ended up in a place where we're now we're a very focused uh, hematology and oncology uh, company with a little bit of an emerging inflammation and uh, immunology business that came out of the core science. So we've stayed very focused on the science. Gilead, the same thing. Biogenetic, uh, the same thing. Um, Amgen, maybe a little bit less, but Regeneron, Alexion, all those guys. So I think on the biotech side of things, we've stayed focused on the science, a little less formal, so you get a little bit more of that. Maybe that's because uh, you <coughs> spent all that time in LA. Maybe it's because a lot of biotechs came out of California, a little bit more cool, a little bit more, you know, uh, but really trying to, to let that innovation and creativity uh, play out. And so I think what we're seeing now is pharma's kind of going back to some of those uh, concepts. The, what's really interesting at the moment, there's a few things. So you got the models kind of shaking themselves out, but where we are uh, today, there's a few things, a couple things that I think are, are very interesting. One of them is that technological and scientific breakthroughs are enormous. I mean, they really, and I think we've made huge progress in a lot of areas, and I think we really are on the verge of breaking through in a number of uh, things. I mean, you see uh, curing HIV, you know, as an example. Uh, you see certain types of cancer being cured. You see certain types of cancer being turned into chronic uh, diseases. I think now that we're there's a scientist in the room, correct me, but you know, 20 years after, or 15, whatever it is, after the sequencing of the human genome, we're just now on the verge of really being able to take that, and then everything that can be done from that, the proteomic analysis, genomic analysis, and really turn that into, I think, some, something very powerful with respect to how we're able to target uh, therapies to uh, different groups of patients. So I think you see that in terms of the innovation uh, that's going on. So I think that's uh, quite exciting. The tension, though, that's the second part of what's really interesting in the system, but we've got to figure it out, is within the healthcare system itself. So the discussion around costs and on pricing and how is this healthcare ecosystem going to come together so that all the participants in it recognize the role that they have to play, the value that they can add, and then figure out a way to work together uh, so that the government does plays its role constructively, industry plays its role constructively. We listen to the patient advocacy groups. Um, the medical community plays their role. The academic community plays their role. The payers do their part constructively, and all that needs to come together in a way that keeps the focus on the patient and incentivizes innovation and then access to the therapies. And we're trying to get there, but it, we don't always feel like we row in the same uh, direction, but I think we have an opportunity to do that. Um, and that's, that's been a big, I think that's been a, a big change. And it's, we're kind of, we're still in the middle of it. Um, so at the College of Business, we're focused on the future of business. So what's the future of the healthcare business, future of pharmaceuticals? Well, you hear a lot about personalized medicine. I, um, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out. Some of us talked about that a little bit earlier. <coughs> I mean, I think we do have opportunities to find ways to leverage data. There's tons of data out there in the healthcare system across all of the people who have something to do with it. The insurers have tons of data, the scientists, the researchers, we all have tons of data. We have data inside of companies, 
the payers have uh, data, there's data in the uh, universities, there's, and we have to find a way to share that. Now that we finally got the electronic medical records, all that done, but there's not anything that's connecting all of that and then pulling it together and, and saying, okay, we have all this data and we can figure out that these therapies work best for these, this profile of patient. And I think that would be the, the next sort of wave of what, if we could find a way to do that, and I know there are people thinking about it, but we have to break down some of the, the walls that say, well, we're not gonna share our data with you and you're not gonna share our data with us and stuff like that. So I think as a country, I really, this is where I think the government could play a constructive <coughs> role in terms of helping us find a way to do that. And then I think that would be a very good uh, starting point to move down this path of saying, patients who look at this profile respond best to this kind of treatment, patients with this kind of profile respond best to that kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. I think that would be um, actually uh, huge. So I think you'll see the industry trying to play a more proactive role in that. And then I think that um, you're gonna continue to see us very focused on the value proposition of our products. So really trying to invest for innovation, forget the me too stuff, and then work with people to help um, the system understand what the true cost of any given treatment regimen uh, is. So you're gonna see everybody talking about immunotherapy <coughs> and targeted uh, therapies and it's, uh, the, the question's gonna be, is, are those just words? Mm -hmm. are, are companies really putting the dollars behind the true you know, investment in the science to make, those, uh, to make those things happen. But I think we've got a huge opportunity to turn a lot of chronic, uh, acute diseases into chronic diseases. The next big thing after that, and I think you're gonna see companies going down that path too, is how do we deal with aging? And if we're gonna turn all these acute diseases into chronic diseases and everybody's gonna live longer, what, is that, what does that mean? Um, but then even just supporting a population living a lot longer, somebody should study that in your, uh, you know, because <laughs> I don't know exactly what that means. <laughs> we have our, our nursing team here tonight, and they have an aging program, so that's a good one. There's a, there's a whole, that's going to be a big deal. Yep. It's going to be a big okay. deal. So a little about you. Um, while you were CFO of Alcon, you came back to UT Arlington and got a PhD. So why PhD and how did that influence your Masochism. career? Masochism. Yeah. I um, must have been the stellar faculty here, I think, <laughs> that really drew me back. I'm sure that's what it was. The, well, I liked the university. I liked, I liked the environment and all of that. So I, at the time, um, in being in the job that I was in, I thought, and I still think, that finance was one of those subjects where you can take the theory and do something with it in practical application, and it's pretty straightforward to make that bridge, and I always thought that in companies, sometimes we didn't stop and think enough about what finance theory really should tell us, and then what we could do with that and maybe ratchet up the sophistication a little bit, but also a dose of common sense. And so I thought it would be interesting to get the degree and try to continue to evolve how we apply finance in large companies. And that was a, a big part of why I did it. Um, I also just like more knowledge, right? So it didn't change life for me too much, other than that for those three or four years, I didn't sleep very much because I was trying to study and do all of that. And I actually got to the point where it quite stressed me, I must say, but it didn't change my career that much. Um, I didn't have to have that, so I don't think people should feel like they have to. But I think constantly adding to your knowledge base in whatever your field is and looking for ways to use it is, is fun and it um, helps the people around you. And so. So what's the most significant challenge you faced in your career? Well, my first CFO job, we filed for bankruptcy, so I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of significant. Uh, actually, the, <laughs> you would have thought I would have stopped being a CFO after that, but that was a, the, I think uh, the biggest challenge actually I find is anytime I have to deal with someone or people who are not objective, 
I can get very frustrated with that. I mean, if you're in any situation in business or personal, for that matter, where somebody has a, a preconceived bias about something and you cannot have an objective discussion and say, you know, there's a win-win here if we'll just do it. So I have a little bit of trouble with that. And how do you overcome that challenge? Keep working at it, I guess. <laughs> There are some people you just can't reason with, but I mean, by the way, that's why we don't have peace in the Middle East, for example. But there, it's, but f trying to find ways to help people see, in most situations, if you really sit down and look at it, you can find ways for both parties to win. Um, I think that's a, an ongoing, an ongoing thing. And so, it's being objective, trying to help people understand that you want to see their perspective and you're thinking about them and not just yourself. So, I'm big on transparency. Mm -hmm. Because I do think the more transparent you are, the more open you are, then people lose a little bit their suspicions. They, at some point, they have to say, okay, this person really just does want us to get to the right answer. Mm -hmm. so. so what mentors or role models have you had? And that, what have they done for you? How have they, how have they affected your life or your career? And all these people in the room here, they're sitting. <laughs> um, I didn't, I never had a formal uh, mentor or role model, um, well, role model, I guess there were people I looked up, I didn't have any formal sort of mentoring programs, but I always found that the uh, people who I had the opportunity to work with who had a lot of experience and were willing to share that, I mean, especially when I was in my 20s or even 30s and moved to Switzerland and didn't know what I was doing, any people who were willing to spend a little bit of time, you know, take me and say, okay, hey, here you Here's my experience I've had with that. You might want to think about this. Those uh, sorts of opportunities I think were great. Every time I've seen somebody handle a difficult situation, that's always helped me a lot to see what, what their character was, how they thought about things. So I probably learned more <coughs> working with people through very difficult situations than when everything is, like is really great. Like bankruptcies, yeah. They <laughs> really saw who was hanging in there and who wasn't. So. But you can have very senior people panic in certain situations, and you can have you know people down at the lowest levels kind of say, "Okay, we're going to do this," and really, and that's very inspiring, and you can learn a lot from that. Um, so, what keeps you awake at night? What do you think about? What do you worry about? What keeps me awake at night, or what do I think about? Uh, what keeps you awake? Hot flashes Hot keep flashes me awake at night. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, do they have a drug for that? I am 53, you know, so that wasn't a very politically correct thing to say, it doesn't matter. So, I'm in healthcare, we talk about these things all the time. Um, I, let me see, well one of the, I mean from a professional standpoint, I do, I feel like things are changing around us so fast right now in our industry, the science is just running, you get small companies that they come up with these really creative ideas, they're willing to take a lot of risks, they'll try things, they'll, and they're just running with stuff uh, all the time, especially uh, in the cancer uh, and immunotherapy arena, so it's just sometimes you wake up and you say, oh my gosh, are we doing, you know, as much as we should uh, be doing, so. The, on the personal side, I actually spend a fair amount of time thinking about now that I'm a, later in my career, what am I going to do one day when I don't do this anymore? Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer yet, so well, I'm sure you have some suggestions. Sure. You have a PhD, right? Yeah. So we're, we're all living longer and working longer, and part of what that means is that often we're moving into second careers, right? Yeah. You finish career one and you think about career two. Yeah. So something like no, so I've been thinking about that, yeah. So how do you do something fun and still give back and be interested by it or sure. whatever? My so parents have a goat farm, so I can always fall back on that. <laughs> so what do you want to be remembered for, personally or professionally? Not goats, I don't think. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, um, I never really spent that much time thinking about that. And then you end up in these leadership positions, and it's 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 quite interesting. So I. I get the most satisfaction out of seeing people reach their full potential. So a lot of what I feel like my job is as a leader is to work with people and understand them and then help them reach their full potential, whatever that happens to mean. So in the workplace, it can be getting the right people in the right roles. Sometimes it's just 
empowering people to be free and to have ideas and go run with things. And when I see people, you know, do that and make the most of their particular skills and talents, I mean, that's just really interesting and I think it's a lot of fun. And any, every time I, somebody comes to me and says, you know, I really like working with you because you let me be myself and then I, I figure out all these things that I can do, I find that extremely, extremely rewarding. So maybe that's it. So that's how you want to be remembered, the one, the one who empowered people. Empowered people, help them reach their full potential, yeah. Okay. So hindsight is twenty twenty. If you could go yeah. back to when you first left school, or this school, undergraduate. It was a long, long time, ago. time ago. What advice would you give yourself? Um, I would probably tell myself to be more self-aware. Would probably um, tell myself to pay more attention to other people's perspective, to learn from other people's experiences that they have to uh, that they have to share with you, because each one of us brings something unique to the table and. We all have something to offer, and learning, taking something from all those things that other people have to offer, I think, is really important. And sometimes, when you first get out of school and you think you're really smart and you're out doing all this stuff, you don't always think about that, um, and, then, and think about why you do what you do, why you want to do what you do. So that self-awareness thing um, is a big deal, actually. If you're, you feel like you have to be the smartest person in the room, you need to understand why you feel like you need to be the smartest person in the room. If you feel really competitive with other people, you need to understand why you feel that way. Uh, so I think and when you do, you, you're a better colleague, you're a better leader, you're probably a better person. So. so as you look around the world today, what do you see that you wish you had invented? Electricity. electricity. <laughs> no? That'd be good. Does anybody disagree with electricity? <laughs> you can't charge your phone. You can't charge your smartphone without electricity, right? We all survive on electricity. We, yeah. mm -hmm. I think, I don't know. And I wish Texas, I could have electricity. Yeah. That would be kind of, that would be a big problem, actually. We would have no lights right now. They wouldn't be able to see us. That's right. We would have yeah. none. Well, I don't know. I don't think we would have these microphones. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they would be better off if they couldn't hear us. Yeah. So last official question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, any general advice for our Hoosby scholars or any College of Business students as they pursue their careers? Do something you like. Don't do something that somebody tells you you should do. Don't chase the whatever sounds like the coolest thing. Make sure that you like it and try a few different things. I think diversity of experience is a huge asset. Obviously, I've worked for 27 companies and I've changed jobs every six months and it hasn't hurt me too much. So, um, But, I, but I, I think it really is very important for you to feel good about what you do and feel like you are have the ability to make a unique uh, contribution. And I mean, I joke about it a little bit, but it might take some time and, and, and being in different environments and different industries and doing different things for you to figure out which thing does really make you feel uh, the best. But I think we, we all will give our best effort and we'll do a better job and we'll be a better colleague and we'll be a better friend and spouse and all of those things if we're happy with, with the contribution that we feel like we're making every day. And I think you really do need to like it. Um, it can't be a situation where you either don't know what your purpose is in that situation or you go and you're like, well, this is a job for eight hours a day or ten hours a day or I don't really like doing this and I don't like that person. Or So really take um, some time to understand yourself, what makes you feel good, what motivates you, what gives you positive energy. You don't want to be drained at the end of the day. You really want to be able to, at the end of the day to feel like you got positive energy from what you what you do, so figuring out whatever that subject matter is, whatever that particular field is, whatever that industry is that makes you feel good about what you're doing, that's the biggest piece of advice I could get, give. I would also say that getting out, having international experiences, doing some, some different things I think is very um, 
very helpful. That was a transformative thing for me to live in a different country, experience a different culture, speak a different language, and have to come at life in a different way. And you really do come at things in a different way if you actually get out there and, and live in a in another environment for a little while. So I think that's a really important thing too. But be self-aware. That's my biggest. You know. Know who you are and what you want. Know who you are and what you want. So we have some time for questions from the floor. Hello, uh, my name is Naira Musaj um, from Bullsby Cortex. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Uh, I just gave it all away, so now I don't have any anymore because you got it all. You, you talked about globalization, and I have a question. So there's a saying in the international business world that uh, think global, act global. And I wanted to uh, see your opinion. Uh, would you hear that globalization is slowly uh, becoming a thing of the past? And Multinationals are starting pushing the liberalization. Could you talk a little more about that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think back to this whole thing with the Dutch and 1602 and whatever, the, I, I think that there have been parties approaching business as with a global mindset for a long time. I don't think that's going to change. Uh, I liked the comments about this is a North Texas economy. It's not Dallas or Fort Worth. Or, and in some sense, we all live on the same planet, and maybe we want to think about it as one big economy. That it's the practical aspects of that that cause the issues, right? The devil's always in the details. The, the, the thing is that just as Texas is different than New York, and San Francisco, by the way, is different than LA, you, you can't go into it with the view that you're going to do things exactly the same way in any given country. So from a business standpoint, if you feel like you have core capabilities and competitive advantages in some area, you need to understand very clearly what that is and then how you can leverage that in different country environments. And I think that at least for the pri previous maybe 20, 30, 40 years, some companies did not get that right. I think some did an excellent job of it. Nestle is a very good example. There are others, uh, Unilever is a, a good example. There are a number of, of companies who did get it right. But what you said about think global, act local, that's what they did. They said, do we have something that we do really well that we should be able to leverage all over the world? That's thinking global. And they said yes, and they figured out what those core capabilities are and articulated them because you need to do that. And then said, well, how do we go do that in the most effective way in the US, in Brazil, in China? And they figured that out by paying attention to the culture, by, for the most part, having local people run the local businesses, but within a framework that was a, a, a globally thought through framework with respect to the core capabilities that they were leveraging. So I don't think that's going to change at all. I also think with the continued evolution of technology and all the information sharing and everything, some of the things that have put out barriers or, or made it harder to do business in different uh, parts of the world are going to fall down at some point. They'll also make it where you have to be on your toes more because it's more competitive, right? If you can see everything that's going on. And There's one back there. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so let me see if I can. Uh, 
Well, I, I don't. Obviously, I've been pretty successful. So there's some things that have have gone well. I'm not sure exactly why sometimes, but uh, I have not ever felt that I was at a disadvantage in the workplace because I was a woman. Now, that may be because. I was fortunate enough to be to not find myself in a situation like that. The there were quite a few times along the way though where there were things that happened that were not politically correct at all. I mean, if you I started working 30 something years ago and the first industry I was in was aerospace and defense, which was a pretty macho industry, right? I without ever accepting anything that I thought was really completely unacceptable, I also found that at certain moments, there were some things that you just let slide a little bit, like not be overly sensitive to certain things. And when my male colleagues saw that maybe I didn't overreact to certain situations, I think they actually respected me more for it afterwards, if that makes sense. So sometimes I think we play up the gender differences a little bit too much. And I try to think about people as just people and not male or female one way or the other. And so I never tried to act like a guy. I just was myself. And I, so though, I mean, that's maybe some of what helped. But I also think if you're really good at what you do, if you're open and transparent and you don't let things kind of, um, fester or whatever in terms of some of that undercurrent, for the most part, I think you're going to be okay. But there are, there will be individual situations where it's not yet where it should be. And I would just say, get out of that situation if that, if that presents itself. But I don't think, I just also just don't think we should run around saying, somebody may throw something at me in a minute, and that's fine. I don't think we should, I don't run around thinking about myself as a woman first. I'm just, I'm a business leader, and then I happen to be a woman, so I think that kind of helps. Sure, people have multiple identities. People have multiple identities, identities yeah. Both salient, it's still the case that, the other thing that I would say in this, so is there, sometimes there does come a point where you, somebody in the room is not gonna like what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Most of us at some point, we do have to make a choice. It's really hard to have everything. So I, I'm not married, I don't have any kids. It was a choice. I moved around, I did all sorts of things, spent a lot of time working, and I have no regrets about that whatsoever. But, and I'm not saying that people can't do what I do and be married and have kids. And it, but there's a lot of things where sometimes something may happen where you have to make a choice and some part of the equation has to, has to give. Maybe not, maybe not, hopefully not. But I do know some very senior women who at uh, different moments got about to the same point that I'm at or even farther and said, you know, this is great, but I really also want more of that, and so I'm not going to do this anymore. Now, that, I've, heard, I've had men say the same thing, too, by the way. So, um, so there, I, there's still issues out there, but I think that... Um, you can, for the most part, I think we can overcome those if we want to. I so maybe I would add something around the choice because I think that's a really pivotal mm -hmm. idea. And I think that a lot of what's happened in the past has been not having a choice. So you must take this career, you must take that career. And, and the most important thing I think for this next generation of, of female business leaders is to make that choice consciously. Yeah, I and agree. And to, to make it for yourself and to decide what you want and then to go and pursue that, whatever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. I think the, the real tragedy is when people have the choice made for them. Yeah, I completely agree. Or they sort of wake up one morning and say, oh, that wasn't the choice I made. Right. right? right. Uh, and so what I would encourage is the, the, especially the female students in the room, and, but the male students as well, is to think about your priorities, to know yourself, to know who you are, and to be self-aware and to consciously make the choice 
and be happy with it. I mean, don't. I have a number of um, female friends actually who have quite powerful careers, and their husbands have been the ones who stayed at home with the kids and did had completely alternative sort of career. And some of those guys are good with that, and some of them you can tell they feel a little bit funny about it because other people make them feel weird about it. Um, and so we just have to get over that somehow. I mean, I don't. But, uh, diversity of thought and opinion and all of that is, and I have, I don't think it necessarily has to be this way, but somehow or another, it is true that women lead differently than men do. It's not always good, by the way. There, but they, but we do lead differently. And if we're leading with our natural Authentic. authentic style, it's, all, it's always good. If you lead with authenticity, you're always going to be good. And when I, when I said it's not always good, if a woman goes out and tries to lead like she thinks men lead, it's not good. And the same goes the other way, too. I mean, but it's, and sometimes I feel like we, I don't know, we get, we, we end up, probably we make ourselves feel that way, but we feel like we have to do that. Um, and we don't. We just be ourselves, you know, whatever that means. Surely. The mic's coming. Is it on? Um, one of the key differences that have kind of changed over the last 15 or 20 years is just the generational differences. You've talked about the gender differences, but what about generational differences? And what advice could you give to the students here tonight who are about to enter the working world um, about how to handle things and how to recognize the differences? That's a great, that's a great question. The, I, I come back to, we need to let people just be who they are. And we're not always great at that in big companies. The, and if we can do that, it may be that a 50-year-old uh, a person wants to come into the office and work certain hours and be a certain way and dress a certain way or whatever, and that a 20-year-old person wants to do it differently. I think we have to find ways to let everybody do things the way that they want to. So I think we still have a lot of work to do within companies to get to that. But as individuals, we have to have an idea of what we're the most comfortable with and why. So even if, I mean, maybe 22-year-old guy sitting here in front of me likes wearing a suit and tie and looking like the 50-year-old guy. You don't look like you're 50, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but, but that's okay too, right? So I, I think that whatever the tendencies of a given generation are that shouldn't, if that doesn't feel right for you, you shouldn't really care. At the same time, we're all a, somewhat a product of the generation that we grow up in because we get used to things, right? We just get used to the stuff that's around us while we're growing up and whether it's technology or whatever. And my mother, by the way, is the worst with her iPhone and this and that and whatever. I don't even have an iPhone. And she does. So I don't think it necessary. So I, I think the but the flexibility in terms of letting those things sort of flow through, and then how do you use that in a constructive way? I, but we have to be more aware about that and just think about not having a preconceived notion that somebody has to look a certain way or use or not use technology a certain way. We have to enable that um, a little bit more. And I think if we know what we want, and and are very lucid about it. And by the way, I'm a huge advocate of speak up. When you're in the workplace or wherever you are, I feel that way about personal life too, but speak up. Talk about what, how you feel about something and what you want and what you don't like and what you do like. And talk, go, your boss is not some person who's supposed to be sitting there telling you what to do and not listening to you. Go tell them. Tell them in the right way. Or, but go tell, and, and, and I think we have a much more uh, influence you know, if by uh, just talking about what you see, what be creative and, and, and just do that. And we don't do enough of that. It's, 
It's, uh, it's quite interesting because we are struggling with that a little bit when we think about how to have an environment where you have people in the office when they need to be in the office, but then you also allow more flex time and you allow more working from home and you allow more just different kinds of settings. And you just you get into a lot of different discussions about that. But then again, I feel like if everybody says, okay, here's what we're trying to get to, so can we all just talk about it? Then we'll find a solution rather than you sit in a room and you have half the people not talking to the other half of the people and these half of the people are policy making people and they're afraid if they let people have flex time that they'll it'll get out of control and then you have these people saying well i'd be much more creative and i'll do a better job if you'll let me have a flexible get together sit down talk about it i think i think you're right that the way the millennials work now is very different than the way that the previous generations work yeah that's what we hear, <laughs> yeah. And you have to, yeah. I mean, what's wrong with that? You know, let, you know. The other thing, then, but then I would also say you, the, this thing about learning from other people. Also, think a little bit about why the people who maybe are two or three generations older than you are do things the way they do, because maybe some of it's not so bad. I'm having trouble oh, yeah, hearing. Sorry. Can you get the mic turned on? Sorry. I'm old. I can't hear. You mean language translation? I don't know if you can always say that one is better. So I think what you need, obviously you need mother tongue people to do the translation, but you need people who understand the nuances in both languages. And then you need to have people who understand something about the subject matter that they're translating, right? So because it's not only the words, it's, it's concepts that, being, that are being conveyed. And it can be very different whether it's in a, a retail setting or a consumer packaged goods setting or a medical setting where certain concepts will mean different things. So I'm not sure that, I have probably seen better results more often if you have the internal capabilities to do it because then you know your business, you know the setting that you're dealing with, you know what the sensitivities are because even in English and even when you're not translating something because of language, when you're talking with certain audiences about the same thing, you're gonna say it a slightly different way. So I think you need people who understand that. The problem is you don't usually have everybody who can cover all the languages that you need to cover. Yeah, no, you, That's you the trouble. Of, well, I, a few better than others, but I can massacre a lot of them. So, <laughs> but so I think if you can do it, when I, I'm, I'm reminded of the days that um, when I was at Nestle and everything was done in three languages, and it was all done in house, and you ended up with, and I can even remember being one of the people who, for certain sections of the annual report because my French was as good as my English, would read them both and say, well, wait a second, that sentence doesn't really say what we wanted it to say. And we did that within the company because we had a lot of people with language skills and everything else, but you usually can't cover 100 countries, right? That's the problem. But then somehow, yeah, if you give all that stuff out to a service, you're not gonna get, a, you're not gonna get the right result. So I think you need to, it's probably gonna be a balance though. If you don't have somebody who can translate into, I don't know, some obscure language, you're gonna to have to get somebody to help. But, um, communications are, well, it's probably one of the most important things, right? In between leaders and people who work with them, between our colleagues and then all of those sorts of things. And by the, I think that is a, a little bit of a challenge when we do this think global, act local thing. How do you really do that in an authentic way? And one of the best ways that we've found is 
have local people as your employees on the ground in those countries. And you train them well, and you support them well, but you have local people. And if you do that, then you can use them for all these things too. And then you have to staff appropriately and not let some cost-cutting person come in and tell you, you'll get a better result if you outsource that. Because it doesn't work. So maybe last question. A good linguist will have a job for a long time. You asked me 20 questions earlier today. <laughs> Real quick, how do you, your, your organization is about making change, making things better. Yeah. How do you handle change outside your So the question was, the, the biotech industry is going through a lot of change, you handle change, but how do you learn about change outside the organization? So the, it's a wonderfully amazing question, because you have change from a lot of different perspectives, right? You have the science that's changing, you have the com competition who may be changing their commercial model or whatever, There's all the regulations change, there's all sorts of things. So the, the, um, there's probably two or three things that I think we do pretty well. One is by having local people on the ground in all the countries that we choose to do business directly in, they're a huge uh, source of wealth of information about what's going on in their country. So we get a lot of information uh, through that channel. We also um, work with, we have a little bit of a unique research model where we're very focused internally on the few areas of scientific expertise that we have. And then we have this big portfolio of about 50 different small company partners who are in research collaborations uh, with us. And we, let, we give them some money and let them uh, do their thing. And they're a huge wealth of information as well because we have this ongoing flow of information back and forth. We assign a person to work uh, with them as their contact person. And so we get a lot of flow of what's going on with the science that way. We uh, try to tap into all the um, academic uh, institutions and universities that are doing research and really foster that uh, flow of information. And we're willing to share as much with them as we you know, get, uh, get from them so they feel like it's an equal uh, uh, thing. We also are happy to invest in people who their jobs every day is to watch what's going on in the competitive environment and kind of bring that intelligence in and then pass it to the rest of us. And somebody could come along and they could probably look at my organization and they could probably say, Jackie, you've got 20 people sitting over there doing market intelligence. You could save $5 million a year if you get rid of them. Well, it could also cost us, you know, 20 million the year after or whatever. So we resist the temptation to kind of shut that stuff off. But you're, you're, just, you're gonna hope you don't miss something, but you may. I mean, have a lot of feelers out there and spend a little money to let it happen, right? So thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you for listening. Really to me. appreciate it. It's been wonderful. You want me to stay here? Or you want me to go down? Or... Okay, stay here. So uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to come and to speak to the group. And uh, as a token, we have a uh, very nice plaque. Wow. You are the 2015 Business Maverick. Wow, here. nice. Uh, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Th